A Russian soldier already battle-hardened has just heard that back home quite a few of the local shops in his town have closed down. Russia's economy is collapsing. He thinks of the men who've already lost their lives, men who'd become his friends. At night, he sleeps on crates of grenades, and during the day, he takes orders from idiots. He's had enough. He's leaving this damn war, but the decision will haunt him forever. This is a true story that mirrors many Russian soldiers' experiences in their war with Ukraine. This guy's war did not get off to a good start. The first days were like something out of a horror movie. He described driving a Kamas truck in a convoy heading in the direction of Kherson, and the closer he got, he started to see dumped Russian equipment more and more frequently. Scattered in the streets and laying in the mud were dry rations, just left there, like insidious omens sprouting from the chewed-up ground. As his truck passed through a village, a Ukrainian man, his eyes filled with tears and his voice infused with a maniacal hatred, ran up to the convoy and screamed, You are all bleeped! The Russian soldier later said, He almost climbed into the cabin where we were. His eyes were teary from crying. It made a strong impression on me. Of course it did. Like many of his comrades, he was not sure that fighting this war was a good idea. He didn't buy into what his government was telling him. When he saw those locals, he wondered how he'd feel if Ukrainian troops were doing the same in his town. At times, he felt great shame for what he was doing. Many of the men did, and many of them couldn't tell you precisely what they were fighting for. It didn't help morale that there was never enough water to drink, their equipment was often broken, they were still waiting for the combat bonuses they'd been promised. Then, from time to time, he hears news from back home that more shops in the cities and towns were closing down due to a failing economy. The war was impoverishing people, and for what exactly? We'll come back to this guy's story soon, but first, you'll need to hear some more reasons why soldiers have been leaving the Russian army in droves. A corporal named Ilya Kaminsky said he was fighting with the 11th Separate Air Assault Brigade when he and many of his comrades decided it was time to pack in the war. They'd only been fighting for four and a half months. Four and a half months, too much. He said later in an interview, I'm morally exhausted. There's absolutely no trust in the authorities and the higher command from the very first word. In his short time in the war, he'd seen his brigade of about a thousand men take serious damage. Around 500 men had been injured or killed in those first few months. He said that no one felt safe, not for a minute. That's not surprising in a war, but some of the men believed the orders they were being given were not rational at times. They felt like cannon fodder. It seemed like the blind were leading the blind. This young guy and 70-plus men in his brigade wanted a fast exit out of the war before they became the proverbial lambs to the slaughter. Many of them had written letters to their superiors asking for reassignment. Their officer said that's not going to happen. What's more, they were threatened with insubordination charges. Just like the first guy we talked about, they realized the only way out of this war was to embrace what you might call drastic measures. Their pleading letters were obviously falling on deaf ears. Nonetheless, just packing up their stuff and leaving was not exactly easy. Let's just remember how seriously militaries take desertion or going absent without leave. The two terms are similar, the main difference being that a soldier might only be called a deserter if he's been absent without leave for a certain amount of time. A soldier could, in theory, go missing, but that might not mean he's deserted. Once someone has deserted, though, that historically means trouble and shame for the family and much worse for the transgressor. The first thing the military has been doing in Russia is trying to convince men that deserting is an inglorious act and only the lowest of the low do it. You might know from some of our other shows that some of the guys called up in this war have only received perhaps two or three weeks of training. It's not much, but it's enough to learn that desertion is a mighty shameful thing to do. They have this drilled into them before they go to the front lines. For instance, in the Russian town of Budyonovsk, which serves as the home base for the 205th Cossack Motorized Rifle Brigade, Russian commanders have put up what they call a wall of shame. We can't say exactly what this wall looks like right now, but back in July, reports stated there were 300 men mentioned on the wall. Next to their photo was their full name rank in a passage about them disobeying orders. This translated as, they forgot their military oaths, the ceremonial promise, their vows of duty to their fatherland. This kind of thing can be powerful, where competitive masculinity is concerned. If you're fighting with a bunch of guys, the last thing you want to be called is a coward or a chicken. For some men, bravery becomes a kind of peeing contest. They might not even care about the reasons they're supposedly fighting for, they care more about the other soldiers saying how tough and brave they are. Problem is, once you're dead, you're not around to bask in the compliments. You won't be missed when you're gone, not by the people who put up that wall of shame at least. One of the soldiers whose name was on that board said as much. He knew what he'd done would not exactly lead to praise, but he didn't care. His continued existence was more important than looking like one of the tough guys. He later said in an interview, I understand everything, of course. I signed a contract. I'm supposed to be ready for any situation, this war, this special operation. But I was thinking, I'm still young. At any moment, a piece of shrapnel, a bullet could fly into my head. He just opted out. He decided he didn't want to fight. 
He explained, I thought a long time about it and came to the decision. I understood that I had to refuse so I could stay alive. I don't regret it one bit. Maybe some of you are now thinking that what he did was disgraceful. After all, he'd signed up without any coercion. That is true, but this guy said also that he and others weren't even given helmets or flak jackets. They didn't have standard munitions and there wasn't even enough food and water for them. Other men came forward and said the same things. Some of them said that the commanders had very little regard for what happened to the troops. They said all they cared about was not giving up their positions. One of them said, they just don't care. You're a soldier for them. You're nobody. As we said, this is not that unusual in Ukraine right now. Remember that guy we talked about at the start that slept on a bed of grenades? He was a junior officer. He said when he thought about giving up the fight, many of the men around him, the professionals and the conscripts, were thinking the same thing. He later talked to the press, but not surprisingly didn't want to give up his name. In an interview, he said, We were dirty and tired. People around us were dying. I didn't want to feel like I was part of it, but I was part of it. When he joined the war, he knew something was wrong at the start when his superiors took away all the men's phones. They were then told they'd be heading to Ukraine but weren't told what they'd be doing or why they'd be doing it. He said that they weren't even brainwashed with the denazification propaganda that Putin had talked about. They knew absolutely nothing about why they were fighting, other than what they'd heard in the past about the Ukraine situation. As you know, those first few days in Ukraine were strange for him and others in his convoy. With all that Russian equipment everywhere and local villagers running out of their houses and screaming at them, it was a tense time indeed, especially when some of those villagers pulled out weapons and started firing at them. He said for the first week he was in a state of shock, adding, I just went to bed thinking, today is March 1st, tomorrow I will wake up, it will be March 2nd. The main thing is to live another day. Several times the shells fell very close. It's a miracle none of us died. But then, men started dying, sometimes after what seemed like counterintuitive orders. Each day he felt guilty about invading another country. And then, when he heard that the Russian economy was in trouble, he just wanted to leave. He saw no point in fighting anymore. Fighting for what? For whom, exactly? Nothing made sense. He soon became just another contender for the wall of shame. He didn't care. One night he was lying in bed and he just thought, damn it, tomorrow I'm going to write a letter and hand it over to my commander. I will say I'm resigning immediately. This was not the same as going AWOL. It was a resignation, but the problem is that militaries tend to not accept such resignations, not now or ever. Can you imagine a British soldier writing such a letter of resignation during World War I? Dear Field Marshal Haig, I'm having a tough time, old boy, and I do hate these blasted trenches. This war is absolutely beastly, and so I hereby resign forthwith. Please accept it, or I am liable to Scarper. You couldn't do that then, and you really can't do it now. That's why soldiers go AWOL and desert. If a soldier is deployed on an active mission, he has a contractual obligation to fulfill. You are committed to a contract, and that commitment is very important, because if you leave, what's to stop a bunch of others from leaving, putting the lives of other soldiers at risk? This is why enlistment contracts make it really hard to just skip out of combat. Still, this Russian guy tried. His commander said, fair enough, but what you're doing is a criminal act. You're betraying your nation. He said there will be hell to pay, but he didn't regress back to the days of Stalin and just unload his gun into the guy's head. A woman named Valentina Melnikova, the executive secretary of the Union of Soldiers' Mothers' Committees of Russia, said that such instances have happened repeatedly in Ukraine. Young soldiers are now saying they want to resign because they either have moral concerns about what they're doing or they're no longer psychologically able to fight. Thanks to the work of Melnikova's foundation, these men are aware they can legally say this, but they will still, no doubt, be threatened with legal action or face a varying number of other types of intimidation. This is not the 1940s. Millennials and Gen Zs are a different breed of human from guys back then. You could say that the days of nobly dying on the battlefield are past us. When the going gets tough, the young of today sometimes get going in the opposite direction. Who could blame them? when they hardly know what they're fighting for and are often not adequately equipped to fight a war. Many, it seems, do not care about being noble. Being noble is no help to anyone when you're dead and you can't look after your family. UK intelligence said not long ago that it received numerous reports of Russian soldiers just refusing to fight. The agency wrote, We've seen Russian soldiers, short of weapons and morale, refusing to carry out orders, sabotaging their own equipment. Such anarchy among the ranks is certainly taking things a step further, but there are plenty of reports of men asking to resign or at least be reassigned, only for their letters to be ripped to shreds. Some are told to rescind their requests and they might be given a cushy job somewhere else, but it seems in general the letters don't work at all. Their only option is to refuse to take any more orders. And that's why a number of Russian soldiers have already been arrested. There are reports of unit commanders gathering up troops unwilling to fight and sending them to a prison in the Luhansk region. Now their photos are on a wall of shame somewhere, and some reports say they're being given just one meal daily. One report said, As of July 20th, the fate of detained soldiers was unknown. 
Even so, imprisoning these guys might well be against the law. In Russian military law, a person cannot legally desert. Still, if he stays in his unit and refuses to fight while saying he rejects his orders on moral grounds, maybe he's suddenly become a pacifist. He's not committed a crime. In some cases, the soldiers tried to resign, but if that was unsuccessful, they refused to fight. As long as they made it clear they were refusing on moral grounds and not just because they couldn't be bothered to fight or said it was too dangerous, they should have been okay. As you know, a bunch of them were sent to prison, so it seems that this exclusion no longer applies. An expert on this matter explained, he's not refusing to carry out orders, so the article on insubordination or disobeying orders isn't relevant either because he's not refusing to do so, he simply declares that he has anti-war convictions. It seems that quite a lot of Russian soldiers had the help of activists before they pulled the pacifist card on their superiors. Others have arranged sham marriages to get out of service, and there have been reports of some soldiers shooting themselves in the leg and hoping to claim compensation, as well as a get out of Ukraine free card. In a phone call that was intercepted by Ukrainian intelligence, a Russian soldier told his mother that he'd had enough. This won't end anytime soon, he said. What the hell do I need this for? At 20 years old, I'm not at all interested in Ukraine. His mother said, that didn't sound very patriotic, to which he replied, I had a commander who shot himself in the leg just to get out of here, and that was in the very beginning. What is there to talk about? Interestingly, he told her that only about 50% of his brigade was still there. Sure, some had been killed and some had been taken prisoner, but he believed some had just gone missing, vanished into thin air. Our people are just disappearing on their own, he said. This has not gone down very well with Vladimir Putin. In September, just as Russia threw another 300,000 reservists into the war, Putin signed a decree that stated a soldier could get 10 years in prison for surrendering, deserting, or refusing to fight. Putin must have been desperate because he also signed a decree that made it far easier for foreigners to get Russian citizenship if they joined the Russian armed forces. This might well be enticing for people who live in the poorer countries close to Russia. As for soldiers who don't try to play the pacifist card and do just run away, they will very likely be hit with that 10-year sentence if they're caught. The best thing they could do is try to get to another country where they could try and claim asylum as refugees, but it seems that that would not be easy at all. Countries may not take them, just as some nations don't want any Russian refugees. Gabrielis Lenz Burgess, the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Lithuania, has said as much. He stated Lithuania will not be granting asylum to those who are simply running from responsibility. Russians should stay and fight against Putin. Claiming asylum is never not complicated. If Russian soldiers try to do this, the country looking at taking them will have to consider what they did in the war and what kind of persecution they'll face in Russia. The country would also have to think about national security concerns regarding taking in Russian soldiers. So imagine, you're a young Russian man and you're really against war. You are then conscripted even though you have a job, a wife, and some children. That's happened many times already. You're against fighting and you don't want to kill any Ukrainians. But if you refuse to fight once you're there, you're looking at shame and bullying and a good chunk of your life behind bars. Moreover, no one will want to take you if you try to escape to another country. An expression the British might use in this situation is you'd be navigating Boop Creek without the benefit of having a paddle. Hiding in Ukraine would not be easy. Even if a soldier had family there, they'd likely just be picked up and taken as a prisoner of war. This recently happened to a few Russian soldiers, and they were asked to speak on video. But let's remember, they had guns at their backs. Still, you have to ask if what they said had any truth to it. One man explained to the camera, Frankly speaking, they tricked us. Everything we were told was fake. I would tell my guys to leave Ukrainian territory. We've got families and children. I think 90% of us would agree to go home. It's hard to say that if he meant that seeing as his life was in danger. As we make this video, there are reports of captured Russian soldiers being executed by Ukrainian forces, a war crime no less, adding to the war crimes already committed by both sides. It looks like most of them were shot in the head, said a forensic expert. There are pools of blood that indicates that they were just left there dead. There appears to have been no effort to pick them up or help them. The Russian government was furious, accusing the Ukrainian soldiers of mercilessly shooting unarmed Russian POWs. Ukraine fired back, saying the Russian soldiers had opened fire on Ukrainian soldiers. They were only pretending to surrender, said Ukraine, and that's why they're all dead now. The New York Times has tried to analyze what video evidence does exist, but with bits cut out, it's not so easy. The United Nations has asked for an investigation into the matter, which will try to ascertain if Ukrainian soldiers had every right to fire back and kill those men, or if the Russians were slaughtered. It might turn out that no war crime was committed, but if it goes the other way, it doesn't bode well for any Russian soldiers who might want to surrender. It's not always easy to know what happens during wars, since both sides employ mountains of lies and propaganda. You'll know that if you've ever been a good student of history like we are at the Infographic Show. Current media narratives very rarely mirror what we're being told about wars 10 or 20 or 30 years down the line. With that being said, surrendering for Russian soldiers could go okay, but we just don't know. It might also go the opposite of okay. 
It's not surprising then that some Russian soldiers are more than willing to say bad things about their fatherland. Their life might depend on it. No doubt, there have been a lot of war crimes committed in this war that we know nothing about, crimes committed by both sides. This is important to understand today because we have to ask what a Russian soldier would do if he wanted to desert when already inside Ukraine. We're not so sure that if he went over to the other side and said, hey guys, uh, sorry about that, my bad, that he'd get much support. Going AWOL in Ukraine for a Russian soldier might be akin to a family of sheep going on vacation to the Serengeti National Park looking for a place to stay at the Lion's Den Hotel. Ukraine has also complained that its own soldiers taken as POWs have been beaten and tortured, with some reports stating that some were executed on the spot, another war crime. This is not what's supposed to happen under the Geneva Conventions Act. Some have been taken as POWs and at times some have been released in prisoner swaps. There are reports that have come back from the UN investigators that have said POWs from both sides have faced hell. UN investigators have said some Ukrainian POWs said they suffered prolonged beatings, were put in stress positions, and even faced dog attacks. The same investigators said Russian POWs complained of being punched and kicked, and others said they were stabbed or given electric shocks. Very few POWs have spoken directly with the press, so all the information in these reports was gathered through official investigators. Nonetheless, The Guardian spoke with a former Russian POW named Anton. He said he thought the war was absurd but ended up fighting in it anyway. At one point he was captured. A bag was put over his head and he was taken into captivity. He said, you shake at the smallest of noises. Every day you hope that this won't be your last and you'll not be killed. He said he wasn't beaten, though he explained, we were constantly told that Russia is finished, that we belong to the bottom of society. They would threaten to starve us. During my captivity, I blocked most of my emotions. I just try not to think about my life. So how is life for a POW? We just can't say. But it seems it's never a walk in the park. As for the worst things that have happened, maybe the UN will tell us in the future. As The Conversation wrote, treatments of POWs by Ukraine and Russia is breaking international rules. That's both sides doing what they shouldn't be doing under international law, but for the sake of today's show, we very much doubt a Russian soldier can put his hands up and tell the other side, it's all been a big mistake, and he can settle down somewhere in Ukraine where the Russian government won't find him. If he tried that, he'd likely be captured, possibly beaten, and then sent back to Russia at some point to face the music there. The music in this case would be an interrogation that might end with a 10-year prison sentence. We can't say how many Russian soldiers have been killed since fighting broke out. The estimates differ wildly depending on which source you're looking at. Some reports say about 18,600 Russian soldiers have been killed since February 2022, although only about half of that number has been confirmed. Thousands more from both sides have been taken as prisoners of war. On top of that, hundreds of thousands of Russians have fled their homeland since the war began, although many of those people, even though they're against the war, have been met with a lot of anti-Russian sentiment in their chosen new home. It's hard to say how many people involved in the Russian exodus were people who might have gotten the call to enlist, but we imagine that number is quite high. For those who were too late and actually ended up on the front lines, some have been found wandering around Ukraine dirty and hungry not knowing where to go. They're now persona non grata on both sides of the border. As with all wars, a certain number of folks have gone missing, which is likely not the best of fates as it so often means they're dead. There is no such thing as a positive outcome for a Russian soldier who doesn't want to fight, but as things stand, he'd probably fare better claiming to be a pacifist than he would be trying to disappear in Ukraine or the wilds of Russia. Now you need to watch what it's actually like to be a Russian army recruit or have a look at what's wrong with the Russian military.